going live. We're going oh. live. We're going live. Okay. Bye for now. And um, it's always funny when I go back and look at these that um, it's got at least 20 seconds that I didn't realize was there already. So we've started. Okay. And okay. Yes. So uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Truth About Public Education, a three-part series. Tonight is part three, false narrative, real consequences. Okay. And so uh, I am Madam Vice President Dawn Shanae Collins of East Baton Rouge Parish. Uh, tonight, I have with me some awesome, amazing, illustrious people. I was just so honored to have each and every person um, that's with me tonight because, you know, y'all all, each of you all blow my mind uh, in, in amazing, equal ways. I did just press webinar start. Uh, let me make sure. Okay. All right. Uh, and so this uh, roundtable talks for anyone who's not joined me before is something that I've been doing every month for uh, a little over a year. This, this year, what I've done with my roundtable talks is a diversity uh, and cultural awareness focus. But I took some time with these amazing folks and did a special edition of the roundtable talks so we can have some uh, we can create some awareness and have a real conversation around when people hear different rhetoric, what does that rhetoric really mean? Where did it come from? Which was part one, if you missed it, part two, well, who, who created the narrative, right? Uh, and why? And then here we are at part three. Uh, and, and I'm going to let uh, brother Keith Eric Benson uh, do a recap after I let you all do some personal intros. But in my uh, welcome and purpose right now, I just want to raise up, and I'm sure my guests will also lift up in their own ways. Um, that when we started part one, we started with that nation at risk, which was during the Reagan administration. And when we closed out part one, and I intend to close out part three the same way, because it's a very important correlation that just cannot be overlooked, right? That nation at risk, war, you know, uh, poverty and crime, and how not too long after that, you start seeing your prison rates go up. At the same time, we've created that, that a false narrative about public education has been created, right? And again, I am a school board member. I'm not sitting here saying to anybody that there are not disparities in education, that there's nothing wrong with things that's going on in education. What I'm trying to help people understand is folks are distracting us with a false narrative for their own profit and gain. And it does not allow us to focus the way we need to on those genuine true disparities. You know, there's nothing necessary to lie. <laughs> there's nothing necessary to lie about, okay? Uh, and so then if folks are lying about what's actually happening, there is a motive and you need to be aware of those motives so that you can, uh, so you can navigate the rhetoric that's going on. So brother, keep, if you can uh, give us a little recap on parts one and two as we go into uh, part three, and then I'll let y'all do personal intros. Oh yeah, so good evening everybody. Um, everybody I've been watching. Um, I'm Dr. Keith Benson, I'm the president of the Camden Education Association in New Jersey. And I say to everyone, every time we've done this, it's our third time and I'm honored to be here, is that Camden, for those folks who aren't aware, is directly east of Philadelphia. So if you look at Philadelphia on the map, directly across the Delaware River, it sits Camden. Um, and that's where I'm the president of the local teacher association. So um, honestly, I'm honored to be here as, as always. I'm appreciative that uh, the folks are here joining me. Um, so to touch on what uh, Dawn referenced earlier, uh, part one, we dealt with primarily the policy, starting with nation, nation at risk during the Reagan administration, on to No Child Left Behind under George W. Bush, and to Race to the Top, which we touched on in, in, in week two, or the second, second session, because we didn't really get a chance to delve into it in the first one. And the second session we dealt into the messaging is actually who's delivering the message of the need and the necessity for reform. And we focus a lot on the billionaires and also how those billionaires are also 
funding a lot of the messengers and the flyers and the, and the, the local board elections and a lot of uh, sort of quote unquote astroturf community groups that are espousing the values of you know, sort of neoliberal um, education reform. And tonight we're gonna to touch on the, uh, the, the impacts in terms of land inside of communities when our schools are taken over. And you know, with that, I'll keep quiet and I guess I'll throw it to uh, Ms. Bats in Indianapolis to introduce herself. Greetings, um, I'm Don Tanya Bats, um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, my background is in law and business. I'm an education justice advocate, um, really looking at this issue from a national, state, and local level because we must be on the forefront of all three of those levels simultaneously because things happen in tandem. And I'm gonna share later on, I hope I get an opportunity to um, some legislation that's passed in many of your jurisdictions that will be the next frontier for the privatizers. But um, what I think to start kick off the conversation, just so you'll know a little bit about me, um, the fact that this discussion is happening all over the country. And many times they're using the same exact playbook in order to replicate according to the culture of the um, of the of the new new location that they go to. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my um, actions is to inform people that we can't keep starting from scratch with new organizations popping up because we're so behind the um, behind the ball that we need to start collaborating more effectively and using what's already been laid out like in Louisiana is one of the premier um, jurisdictions in which this um, test has been um, playing out. So I'll start yeah, there. Experiment <laughs> are like in our statute experiment. Exactly. In Louisiana statute. But yes. I'll pass it to Gloria. All right. Thank you so much. I was just about to like jump out of my seat while you were speaking. <laughs> 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 um, I am, I just, I don't have all the credentials. I'm just, I'm just one of those folks that uh, I call myself a mad mama. And uh, I got involved with uh, some advocacy work uh, in St. Louis after I saw some of those disparities uh, that Don talked about uh, at the beginning of this conversation. And so um, I had, I'm from St. Louis, I went through, uh, I was educated in St. Louis public schools, graduated and moved away from home, was gone for 16 years, but came back in 2014 with a husband and two babies about to enter school. And so saw those disparities and wanted to get involved. Uh, and I wound up on the dark side, y'all. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Not the dark side. Yes, I, and they were telling me that I was woke, but I was not woke over there. And I just started to ask a lot of questions, and I was met with a lot of resistance and gaslighting and all of the things. Um, and so I had to propel myself out of that space and now know that I have to uh, put in that time and, the, and that fight and start coordinating just as hard as I was. Um, I just started my third year. Um, in the association, love, love, love what I do. And um, I would like to speak on more of, as an education practitioner, when I started to see the shift and the change of privatization and calling schools, failing schools and um, all of those different scenarios. So I'm really, really looking forward to uh, getting deep into that conversation and hearing what everyone else has to say as well. So I'm excited to be on this tonight. Thank you for inviting me, Absolutely. Madam Vice President. Uh -huh. All right. All right. <laughs> yes. I'll pass it on to uh, Ms. Schneider. Well, thank you, Tia. Um, I am Mercedes Schneider. Uh, I know Dawn from about a decade ago uh, when Jindal was governor of Louisiana and we were trying to get rid of him. Um, I am a native of Chalmette, Louisiana, and I lived away for 14 years, ended up in Indiana, and I was teaching at Ball State uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, and the short story there is I wanted to come home, 
Uh, and I returned to the public school classroom in the process of coming home, was told uh, that that is uh, seen as going backwards, that if I did this, I wouldn't have a career again in higher ed. Uh, but I thought at the time that I would be shucking off the politics I had run into in higher ed. Now that, that worked for, for a few years. I came back in 2007. Then changes were happening in Louisiana and around 2011 uh, and Bobby Jindal was involved and uh, all of a sudden he was turning on the teachers saying that the teachers were the problem, wanting to freeze our pay raise. And I noticed that newspapers were not picking up what was going on. They wouldn't do it. And so the way I got involved initially is I started leaving comments in the comment section of local papers saying, hey, you're not hearing the whole story. You're not being told the whole story. Uh, by 2013, I had started my blog. I had started writing books. I have four books related to education reform published. The last one right before COVID hit, February 29th of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, that last one is about how I do my research. And so uh, my doctorate is in educational research and statistics. Okay. And so I'm in an unusual position in that I have public school experience, and by experience, I don't mean I just went in for a year or two to be able to say that. Um, I have the better part of 30 years in the public schools. I have five in uh, higher ed at the college level, a couple part-time years in there. I started teaching in 1991 in St. Bernard Parish, uh, which was highly racially charged, and I didn't know it growing up. I didn't know uh, why? No, I didn't know any black people in Chalmette, Louisiana. And all of a sudden you cross the New Orleans line and there are all the black folks. I didn't know that. I didn't understand that growing up. But since then have done a lot of research uh, behind that. And my advocacy, much of my advocacy is in my research and my writing. Um, I have people contact me. Uh, behind the scenes uh, saying, hey, have you heard of this group? Can you help me find out something on this group? Tell me where I might look. Uh, and, you know, different people, different walks of life. Uh, and interestingly enough, two of my books were used as textbooks at LSU. Uh, so, so much for higher ed saying I would uh, lose my cred from going back to the public school classroom. That has, that has not happened at all. And uh, so that's what I bring to the table. I, uh, I, am, I continue to be a public school teacher. Um, I am in my 15th year since my return to Louisiana uh, after Katrina in 2007. Had a couple years in Louisiana before then. Taught five years in North Georgia, uh, also in the public school system. Uh, so a lot of public school uh, background for me. And so it's chiefly, I think, uh, the research uh, component that I bring and that I can help equip people to understand what they're seeing and how to find answers uh, when they do what Gloria said, uh, they start asking questions, you know, and sometimes they don't know what questions to ask or where to go to find information or what information they have a right to know. Uh, and so I will leave it at that. Very pleased to be with you all tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, so, and Merce not Mercedes. Like it's Mercedes. I'm sorry. It was my father's <laughs> idea. Mercedes. It's a common. It's a common name, the turn of the last century in New Orleans. If I run into women from New Orleans, older women particularly, they know it's Mercedes. They know it. Cool. Look, when we get to uh, talking about the accountability system, uh, I hope that you, I, I noticed that you uh, did a blog recently about the student data used to tag kids as potential criminals in the state of Florida. And so, uh, yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, so when we get to that place, um, I hope you're able to uh, lift that up. 
uh, because I think that's very obviously very related in light of what I mentioned when we first opened uh, with the correlation of prison rates and this new narrative of failing schools. So, um, and everybody can chime in on this. Uh, if we could uh, get some folks to just that, that when people say accountability, I think everybody, including myself and everyone here, believes very strongly in accountability. Uh, it's one of those words that you you know you believe folks. I, I'm an elected official. I need to be held accountable. Uh, as 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 parents, we we have to be accountable to uh, our children and and their success uh, and things of that nature. But uh, it means to me that when we talk about the accountability system. And we're really dealing with a whole other animal. And so chime in if you, as you will um, on when you hear about the accountability system as it relates to education, some overall uh, thoughts, concerns, or what have you, bearing in mind that we're going to break it down by state on some details as we move further. What the, the first thing I think of is that those who push for it the most are not accountable. They, they are not the accountable ones, okay? And they don't want to be the accountable ones. They want to be the controllers. They call it flexibility. They try to brand it as empowerment. They try to sell it with those labels. But they, they themselves want to be in control of whatever it is that they are marketing. And it is marketing. Uh, that that they are trying to sell as making others teachers and such accountable. Anybody else? I saw that, Gloria. I, just, I think you snapped it down. Snapped on. Yes, they they want to be in control, but they don't want to be accountable. I know that for a fact. <laughs> they want transparency and all of those those nice little buzzwords. Uh, but they're not ready to 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 show the proof and, and have receipts on things at all ever. Um, but one thing, and it, this is just a quick point that I that I think of when I think of accountability, uh, especially like tying it to um, education and, and those systems. I'm thinking of democracy and having um, systems where we the people can have a voice. Uh, we the people can sound off. We the people can band together and work. And so that's that's via um, our union. That's via via the voting booth and all of those things. And so those that that brings to the top of my mind when I think of the the accountable bodies. And and uh, you'll get into details as you see fit when we go uh, and talk about what's going on in each state. Uh, but is the accountability system in your state, uh, do, you, do you have concerns about the accountability system in your state? Well, in Indiana, we have essentially two accountability systems, one for the public schools and one for the charter schools. And then of course the private schools are behind the veil of privacy, uh, yet they take state dollars. Um, so we really don't know what's going on in the private schools. However, when we're talking about accountability in education, mainly what they're talking about is the lessening of the achievement gap. And the way they are monitoring or measuring this is how well do students perform on the daggone standardized tests, which change from year to year, from publisher to publisher. Um, and, the, and there's this constant moving bar. And what's interesting, and you know, you've got these, you know, growth and proficiency where one charter schools are graded on growth only for X number of years and then get to be touted as a school. So if they go from 2% growth to 4% growth, oh my gosh, look how much we've grown. We've doubled our growth. And you say double, but you don't understand that their proficiency level is still at a failing level. And yet, public schools are graded on proficiency, which means do they know the material? Are they proficient? Can they read, write, et cetera? And then, and then, and growth. And so, so you measuring growth to growth, public schools and charter schools are doing almost the exact same amount of growth. And they're almost proficient at the same level, except the ones that are 
deemed or held accountable or to a higher standard are the public schools that that whose resources are constantly being drained away and teachers are um, constantly being burdened with extra paperwork and excellent teachers have left because of the um, documentation of the documentation for the documents they need to justify why they need to keep their jobs. For, I'm being sarcastic, but literally that's what teachers have told me. And so, and what's interesting in Indiana is now that the movement um, for charter schools has really gained a lot of um, strength, what's happening is now the legislation is changing to alleviate the same standards that were, eliminate the same standards that were required um, to justify a school staying open in, in the public schools are now being erased because those accountability measures don't matter because our new shiny charter school is, um, needs some flexibility to innovate. Um, and how <laughs> they reflect this. That's how you innovate. And how do they measure innovation? They just innovate. check the time of the school, that the time well, is, if that's innovative, how do they? Go ahead, Tina, you was about to say something. I, I, I said that's been a key word that I've been constantly hearing, like um, almost like that, that that word that has been consistently dropped year after year after year. Anything with innovation, something that's, you know, just a tad bit different, come on in, as if the traditional public school can't offer the same thing. What I wanted to touch on is um, the accountability system during the pandemic. And I was really, ex I was extremely troubled by this. At the beginning of March, no, the end of March, um, around that time, 2020, I, I knew that it was going to be questions about if whether or not we were going to require the students to test or not, what that was going to look like, if they were going to be waived. And I'm hearing individuals who are not a part of the traditional public school system, I want my scholars to test. They're ready, they can do it. Right, right. Some of them probably just lost their parents grandparents lord knows who else and you really want them to test after the days had passed that would require our state to be eligible for a waiver you really want to do that okay secondly during this last school year um senator fields uh presented a bill that would waive that would not um allow the students to be tested during the year at all well mm -hmm. The powers that be wanted that to happen because they wanted to see if whether or not um, where the students were going to be after, I mean, during this time, during the pandemic. I mean, I was <laughs> I was against it, but I said if it was not punitive uh -huh. against our students, mm -hmm. I said, that's fine. Let's, let's see where they are. Mm -hmm. Well, what I didn't know was in some districts, mm -hmm. Some districts, they were using the test as a percentage of the child's grade. Well, that's not fair. Yeah. That means it is punitive, yeah. and it shouldn't have been. And I remember telling a, a number of individuals that had I known, and I'm sure Senator Fields feels the same way too, had yeah. I known that there were districts that were going to still use that as um, as a, a determination of whether or not a child passes or fails because you're incorporating it in their grade, I was going to say absolutely not for any of it. Absolutely not. Now, before we move, before we move on to from the general uh, conversation about the accountability system into specifics, did anybody, um, you know, I think that. Um, one thing that's very important for people to remember, and I'm gonna just keep mentioning it periodically during tonight is that, and and Dontania kind of alluded to it, is that like, well, what does all, you know, hold folks accountable, what does all this mean, testing, testing, testing? I think it's important for people to understand that the outcome of these high state tests is not, moving kids up okay we've been doing this for 
several decades and children are not uh, nationally, nationally, not just little old Louisiana that's already at the bottom of the totem pole. Like is that kids are not progressing significantly in their educational attainment. So we doing all of this, we subjecting our public school students to things that private school students don't have to be bothered with. We subjecting our public school educators to things that folks who can avoid it and afford to avoid it don't have to deal with. But there's no education. When you look at our national testing, the NAEP, it's no progress, but 20 years of doing this. All right, so specific. Specifics. Let's talk about Louisiana first, because we, uh, you know, I'm in Louisiana, so let's let's hit up Louisiana first. Specific flaws that have been identified, uh, Ms. Snyder, or um, uh, Dr. Mills, uh, as it relates to the state of Louisiana and the accountability system. Especially, uh, Ms. Snyder, you you have some statistical. I could I could go on for a long time. Uh -huh. with this, but I won't. The first, the first piece that I wrote uh, was in December of 2012 and uh, retired teacher uh, and colleague Lee Barrios, whose name you might remember, Dawn, she was an advocate. She was yes. 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 Yep, yep. She asked me uh, to explain a study that George Knoll of LSU had conducted regarding VAM and could I could I write a VAM explanation on the eighth grade level for legislators? Uh -huh. She said, can you do it on the eighth grade level? Because legislators, they don't, they don't have the time, they don't take the time to read and anything that's going to be too much for them, they're not going to pay attention to it. And so I'm like, all right. And that VAM study was terrible. In fact, uh, George Knoll actually quit and wouldn't, wouldn't vouch for that study anymore. Um, but the predictability was just trash. And so I showed it was all over. It just couldn't predict anything. But Mark, still, it gives them. Can you let people know what VAM is for those who just may not know? VAM. VAM is an idea, uh, it's called value added modeling and modeling meaning a statistical model, statistical um, algorithms or equations uh, that can be used to predict, supposedly, they can be used to predict. And the idea behind VAM is that uh, student information is put in and a student is supposed to get a certain score if the teacher's teaching, that's the idea that everything else can be accounted for. And all that's left is the teacher's influence on the student, which is not true. A greater influence, of course, is the student's home on the student and background and, and whatever opportunities that student has, as well as the student's preferences and interests. You know, I don't control someone's mind completely, but the idea is that uh, when teachers, uh, when VAM is used on teachers, a score pops out. There's no margin of error. It's just a score. And if this teacher is supposedly teaching, then, then this student will get this score in the end. And other, you know, depending on where the student started. And they say, oh, we figure things in about the student, you know, about certain demographics, absences, socioeconomic status. You cannot figure as much in on a complex human being to predict a score. Otherwise, we could use it on parenting mm -hmm. and produce perfect children, mm -hmm. you know, but heaven forbid that we suggest that, that we do anything to the parents. Enough parents feel ultra responsible as it is. But this is a very easy way to produce numbers. Numbers are numbers seem like they are just so objective, but they are not objective. You have to know what you're looking at. And anyway, I got my start doing that. And since then, over the years, that accountability system has been softened. And to be frank with you, um, school systems will seek stability. They, they do not want disruption and parents really do not want disruption. They don't want high turnover in the schools of the teachers. They don't want to know 
who, who, what's going on with the school, who's hired at the school and all this great turnover. They don't want all of that. They want stability. They don't want school closure. Oh, your scores weren't high enough closed. We're going to reopen a new school. You don't know what you're getting. Uh, and so uh, in the quest for stability, apparently not enough teachers were being fired. Not enough teachers were being let go. So so on the one hand, there was a narrative that developed that, oh, you know, these teachers were keeping these bad teachers. But behind the scenes, and this is from from even from the likes of the state, which was run by John White at the time, a notorious education reformer, there were there were there were guards put in place like in the name for example of empowering the principal okay okay if your teacher's going to get the lowest score uh the you know the in that inadequate score uh then the principal ha now has a right to raise it a level or could lower it a level so the principal could override uh and since then also vam is not 50 percent of the score it's going down what is it now 35 30 percent uh of the score so they played the game uh and you know it's still very much a game it's very much a game all these years i've been under this i haven't been under vam i've been under something else uh, where I set my student learning targets, which is, you know, it's just not standardized assessments plugged into a formula. But uh, I've told my administrators, just don't score me the lowest to where you have to put me in remediation. You know, I don't want to bother with them. I don't care if you say that I'm less than proficient. I don't care about the label. It doesn't matter to me. But I want to be able to teach in my classroom and I will do what I can to fight to teach even though all of this testing just eats so much out of the schedule, so much money, so much resource, you know, and, and trying to evaluate all the teachers, so much administrative time. And Dawn, I'm going to just stop there for now because I could literally just go on and on with this, but what I'll just let it be right there. Uh, what about impact to students? From me or from, uh, are you asking others? you or Dr. Uh, Dr. Mills? And, Dr. Uh, Mills, why don't you take that and, one? Matter of fact, Dr. Mills, right quick, because I, mm -hmm. I like to make sure st certain things are clear. Uh, Mercedes, Mercedes. You almost said Mercedes. 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 I just keep on to say Mercedes Benz, Mercedes. <laughs> Well, before you know it, you're going to say Mercedes Benz. <laughs> right. <laughs> there it is. There it is. When you said, just real quick, and then I, I, I definitely want to hear Dr. Mills dive in deeper. When you said that as a teacher, you didn't care if you were labeled proficient, how people wrap their heads around how proficient is defined in the first place? Like, why, okay. why would you say you didn't care about that label? Gotcha. Well, because it is only a label and it's a nonsense label because the those closest to me, um, my students, their parents who interact with me, the school administrators, they know me. They know me and they know that these scores, it's just a game. Uh, in fact, how exactly some of these scores are arrived at, you know, who knows? Who knows what's being put in and how the scores are being arrived at? And I'm going to tell you what all good teachers know is that what I need to do is I need to find out where my students are academically, personally, you know, personal growth, the whole student, whole child, and move them forward and move them forward, challenge them enough not to frustrate them, but to challenge them and move them forward. And that looks different for different children. And so, it, you know, by the end of the year, I teach senior English. I hope that they are better thinkers, 
more critically about their lives, their world, their choices, you know, through our study of literature, that they are better writers, uh, that they have developed more of a work ethic, you know, that they have developed tenacity. None of this is captured in a test score. None of it is. But it's what makes quality human beings who can enjoy their lives and contribute to society. And so when I say I don't care about the label, that label that comes from test scores and such, it's nonsense. And it, if, if we look at that as the end all be all, it's only going to pit teachers against each other. You know, like, I don't want that student, that student's a low scorer. I don't want them in my class because what if they don't score high enough? Never mind that they learned. Never mind that they learned to value themselves and learn a little bit about themselves in the process and that they, they developed a good relationship with an adult. But, you know, if they don't meet that VAM expectation, then, then it goes against the teacher. And heaven forbid that I should ever look at a child in my room and my, my thought is, I can't teach you because you're going to make my score go down. Dr. Mills, elaborate and, and, and add your, you know, your own perspective and your experience, if you will. Oh, my goodness. So many things fill my head. Um, so I'm a special education teacher. And you already know, you know, where I'm going with this. I'm already there. <laughs> I had students who were low incidence, couldn't speak, couldn't write, couldn't, uh, couldn't comprehend anything literally wise, but they were taking a high stakes test. Great. Now, Dr. Mills, are you saying the same test? You're not saying the same test that everybody else takes. There, there, <laughs> yes, there were some who did take the same test that everybody else took. And I remember when the shift was uh was done, when the changes were made, and I was I was just blown completely away. I said, two, I, I have a I had a, a, a class of, of six students. Well, half of them couldn't speak. So how were they even going and, and they couldn't write? Their their goals were self help skills, but you as an educator, Dr. Mills, with your whole doctorate, now you're supposed to be able to defy medical limitations, sister. Now come on now, you mean to tell me that you couldn't do that? You couldn't get those kids to take the same test and be successful on that same test? I absolutely could not. It would it would be a, a divine. Um, it, it, yes, from God. Yes, or or, or somewhere. And, and, and I say, you know, I'm joking, and I said facetiously. I'm 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 dead. I'm serious. I, I I think about them, and that 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 really that was painful to watch. Extremely painful to watch them. <laughs> I mean, even to, for the attempt to even be made. It was it was it was disgusting to me actually. Looking at them, looking at the students I taught when I was teaching at an alternative school, and many of them were low performers. Mm -hmm. So they were pushed out mm -hmm. because they acted out in class. But I'm acting out in class because I can't read. And I don't want my classmates to know that. Mm -hmm. I can't spell. I can't um, do any any math computation. And I don't want my classmates, my peers, to know that. And so I will take the focus off my inability to do certain tasks in class. Dr. Mills. out instead. Dr. Mills, yeah. yes ma'am, as it relates to your role, you, 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 you are an educator with firsthand knowledge, but then also you are the president of the association yes. of, for the state of Louisiana. What, as it relates to the accountability system, 
what are two or three primary concerns that you hear from your members? The primary concerns that I hear are students who are, first of all, over testing, toxic testing, mm -hmm. everything being data driven, you know, absolutely having to be data driven to the T. And third is not taking into account the different variables mm -hmm. that come with students being able to learn. How can they learn if they haven't eaten mm -hmm. over the weekend? Mm -hmm. If they're focused on, if I'm gonna have a meal when I get home, or if I don't have lights when I get home, so I can do my homework, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, have water to take a bath or clean my clothes so my so I won't be teased by my peers. You know, those are things that you can't count those mm -hmm. in four. And what I loved about being at uh, at the alternative school is I was able to reach my students and tell them, I don't know what you did at your previous school. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Let's start off clean. Mm -hmm. And they were able to open up to me eventually and tell me, I need help. I don't know this. Can you help me do that? Mm -hmm. I'm concerned. I mean, they were able to be vulnerable with mm -hmm. me. Restorative justice worked I mean, phenomenally mm -hmm. at, at the school. And, and that's something that we saw on referrals for years, uh -huh. but didn't actually know what it was. Hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. God for, yay. right, uh, right, Key? Yep. So then, um, Don Tanya, you had mentioned um, some things that uh, you had mentioned something and, and it was alluding to uh, certain aspects of the accountability system. Do you want to go ahead and, and, and tell us what's going on where you are? Um, what's going on where we are is the fact that traditional public schools, as we think of it, um, especially in urban areas mm -hmm. and those areas that are now being gentrified, um, are not gonna be what we traditionally think schools are to be. There will be always a public school system. Um, the trend in our area as a result of the accountability or the lack thereof for charter schools, there are, if you look at the laws that pertain to traditional public schools like this, about this many laws are the laws that charter schools have to abide by. And now that we have moved to um, allow private students to access school vouchers and you have to qualify 90% of, um, uh, you know, 90%, let me tell you this, income levels have risen for now six figure income households are now able to access voucher money. Okay, where the program was supposed to be only for um, low income families who couldn't access private education. Now we've got parents who would have sent their children to private schools anyway, now taken away from the big one pot of educational fund resources in the state of Indiana, going to charters, private schools and public schools and the students who need it the most and are being held accountable um, to the highest standard are those students who are lacking in food, shelter, um, parental supervision, et cetera. So we're punishing people for being poor mm -hmm. and rewarding individuals to create this three-tiered or this mm -hmm. parallel systems of education that have different accountability measures in the name of equity, which is one thing that drives me insane, using the language of equity to confuse the issue, um, but while well, at the same time stabbing um, um, and undermining the most vulnerable in our society. So accountability in Indiana um, is an interesting phenomena because we are utilizing the ALEC playbook to a T. Mm -hmm. And um, ALEC is the American Legislative um, Exchange Council, which prepares model legislation across the country to push a conservative and ultra conservative agenda. And it's not just in education. There are 28 issues that they list on their um, on their website 
that go from energy, healthcare, every aspect of society is being addressed by Alec and our laws are being, so it's the corporatization of, of our society. And if you really wanna think about it, I think there was a comment that Ms. Um, Mercedes made um, about the purpose of education. She alluded to that. Right now, the purpose of education is not to create critical thinkers um, to ensure that we have a, the pres preservation of our democracy. It's really about creating workers um, for corporate America. And if you look at these, I don't, in Indiana, we have pathways. So in the sixth grade, you take a test and they determine what pathway you're going to go to beyond whether you're going to be an engineer or um, a construction worker or an educator, whatever. Sixth grade, I changed my major three times when I was in college as an adult. And so now sixth grade, you're on this particular path. And so um, schools are being built around this model to ensure that children have jobs or, em or employable when, they're, when they graduate. So now we're creating th a, a school for thinkers and a school for workers. So we're gonna make sure that these workers, the future workers of America have the skill set so that we, we can keep making our profit off of, you know, cause you know, you only, uh, it just, it's, it's just an interesting phenomena, the direction our country is going in or has always been in. And it's been in the works for, for generations, at least 50 years, the, this agenda is now being manifested. Um, that's and, right, Alec, Alec started in 1973. That's right. So, but it was, it was a secret. It was a secret until about 2011, Common Cause blew it wide open. But yes, right. good distinction, done time you between uh, workers and thinkers. That's, yes. So I just, I, it's just, the bottom line is we need to wake up. We need to organize. And um, we know the issues. Mm -hmm. It's now time to start organizing and leveraging our power in order to make some real sustainable change. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a doer. Hence, mm -hmm. um, after understanding and researching this for over for many years, and, it, and like I, I mentioned before, it seems like we're always starting over every time we it, they set up in a new in in um, city or state or whatever, and and all they're doing is the same thing over and over again. And the interesting thing is, they tell you exactly what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and how they're going to do it. Very true. It's just that we just get distracted with the language and the buzzwords that sound like fight the power, and ain't no. And it ain't about all power to the people. <laughs> and then, you know. Um, I, agree. I agree with that, that where you're going with that, that we're okay. getting caught up in, in there. They have got, I think, a little bit more savvy in attaching themselves to movements that uh, are meaningful to Black folks and Black and brown people and all of the, the, the orgs that we have are all about this liberation and empowerment and we'll use some of those icons that we know and love and say things like you know start you know quoting Shirley Chisholm about the seats at the table and the, you know unbought and unbossed but they are actually bought and paid for um, and it is really it really really runs deep and it's um, once I caught on to it uh, personally it just really burned me up because I just know that they're just really selling dreams to us. Um, and so like Dr. Tia was talking about those students that really need the most and that are struggling. Those are the students that they put out of charter schools. And so the ones that the schools that they have currently that they're pointing to the test scores and they're saying, hey, you know, look over here at this, at this public school, they're not doing their job. We should come in and take over. You should let us take over and this is our proof and then they're pointing to the schools that are in place already um, but they've already kicked the students out who are not performing they don't uh St. Louis Public Schools has um I would say quadrupled the number of students that are homeless so the McKinney Bento Act so those students who can enroll um anywhere like if they don't have an address let's say they're couch homeless and they're, they're living with a, with a relative or whatever they can come to St. Louis Public Schools. St. Louis Public Schools welcomes them, um, but the charter schools don't. They don't have to. And so those students who have those 
special needs and those um, those that, that need those IEPs. Now, some of the charter schools do have some of that in place, but it's very limited. Of the 30 um, plus school, 30, I think we have like 37 charter schools and some un are under the same umbrella. Only small groupings of them actually offer those services yet. Uh, recently, they were in the state legislator in, in state legislature in Missouri, trying to take money away from the public schools to give to to those charters. And so, it's just it, it's it's a big mess, and we really just just lost focus. Um, and so, just kind of going back to what Dantanya is saying, we just need to like organize and start having these conversations across. Uh, because they have their stuff together. They have their PR teams. I'm telling you, before I left the organization that I was working for, they were in the process of hiring some really savvy, like, you know, things that you wouldn't believe, like what scandal with, um, <laughs> with uh, yeah, with our sister on there, Olivia Pope. Yeah, right yeah, the they were hiring teams of folks like that to represent and really push their narrative. Um, whereas there's not a lot of money on the side, this side of, um, you know, this not, not taking over the takeover mission has a lot of big engine behind it. And so that's something to really, really, really overcome. Miss Nolan, I have a question. Uh, did they get as savvy as like allowing certain uh, advertisements to come up? Like while you're watching the YouTube video or while you're on Facebook and all those wonderful things, um, do they offer like a special incentives to the parents if they enroll their student, like possibly, you know, giving them X amount of dollars or paying for a, a new television for them or things like that? I mean, I was some like, of those, I, I, yeah. Some of those things are in play. There are incentives for parents um, bringing their students over to those schools. Um, and it's incentives for parents to recruit. Uh, now, other parents. So yes. Now. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Let's tie that back around to the whole accountability piece. Why is why can't why can't and then I'm gonna come back to you, Don Tanya, about something and then Brother Keith, I we, we definitely got to get you in on this before we move on to the rest of it, past the accountability part. But why can't those charter schools just simply hold up their letter grade or what, whatever they use over there where you at Gloria or Dantani. Like, why can't they just say, come over here? Cause you know, why, why I have to give you a, a $50 gift card or a laptop or I'll give you some tickets to the little local celebration station or whatever y'all have over there, the little entertainment complex. You know, why do they have to be gimmicky? Why can't they just say we better? Then the school down the street, why do they have to be gimmicky? Well, what what are they calling in the accountability system? In my experience in Indiana, those gimmicks, because like I said, the playbook is exactly the same, um, are used to gain parent engagement. And considering parent engagement is low in public schools, that enticing, oh, look, they're drawing me in. And if you are going to pay one of my light bills, and the public school down the street is not. I don't care if you're better or not. But to be honest, in all fairness to all parents or most parents, yeah. most parents want the best for their students. And back to Gloria's point, marketing campaign has been great against the public school system. We have, we have been conditioned to believe that the public schools are educating our students. And in many cases, let's not, let's not play it like you said before. Let's admit, our public schools have not done a great job educating black and brown and poor students. There is some improvement to be done. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, and, and here's, here's, here's the whole setup. You talk about this accountability. Why can't they just hold up their sign? So we got this thing in my ear telling me, oh, this public school is horrible. Their grade is D, F, C, whatever. And um, which is measured differently than the charter school over here, which is an A plus school with a nice shiny new paint and new building and young, vibrant staff with a black leader in place. <laughs> so the privatizers have gotten very savvy by utilizing and, and um, because now the laws even to be um, a superintendent in Indiana, you don't even need a doctorate degree. 
you can become a superintendent with a master's degree in education. Hence, the we, standards to gain. But not for the leadership of the students. I'm happens. just going to tell you. I'm just telling you what's happening. You know, you don't even need a license to teach in a charter school in Indiana. So let me, so one last thing that you, I, I want to go back to this piece that you mentioned about the corporatization, the vouchers for the private schools. This is another thing that I noticed as well. So they magically raising the, 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 the threshold uh, where you are on who can qualify for a voucher to go to a private school. It, to me, this is what's comical about it, if you will. It's very well known and researched to the extent that many reformers will also admit that vouchers don't work and they because they they like, okay, you know, it is just too well documented. It's very well documented that if the same child that if the same cohort of children that 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 was at that public school went to that private school and then now they take the same kind of test at their private school, they do worse than their peers, excuse me, peers, not cohort. They, they do worse at that private school than they would have at that public school with that bad label. But because the private school doesn't have to be held accountable, no one knows that that, that child is doing worse if you want to accept that that, that that accountability system is valuable and actually doing something, right? If you want to accept that that accountability system is valuable and actually doing something, then vouchers should never be part of the conversation because those children do not do as well when they go to a private school. Now, yeah. think about for a second because they're making money and making profit and then they're allowing other people who can afford to pay to play that game if they want to. And, but we looking down on our babies at our neighborhood school. We looking down on our teachers in our neighborhood school. Brother Keith, I'm gonna let you have the floor and close out the accountability and transition us into the impact on community. Because what people need to understand about this accountability system is not just how we feel about the accountability system and whether or not it's bogus the way it's used and the, the calculations and measurements that are used to come up with it that change every year so you really don't have a true comparison of anything, okay? The, the biggest piece about it is that this was used to pull the trigger on what's happening in your community, okay? So Brother Keith, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, what you said is, is exactly correct, is that um, that for a long time, for decades, uh, standardization or in terms of curriculum or in testing was what has been advocated for by, I keep going back to the billionaires because that's where it starts. And that's where all this stuff starts at. Um, and folks who want to, uh, are in favor of privatizing what is a public good, which is public education. Um, and the, the way to show um, that if schools are not doing well is by administering a test and making the test really, really, really difficult for any child anywhere to pass. So one thing to really understand is that the the tests that are the tests that are used and the, the penalties that are associated with the test and performance of it are not things that are catching anybody by surprise. So no. the people who are making legislation and um, using tests as a as a as a high stakes metric know exactly who's going to fail before the bill is signed. They know what 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 neighborhoods are going to be taking it taking over in terms of uh, public education. What students are going to be victimized. What teachers are going to be victimized specifically. So none of this stuff was a surprise. None of this stuff was catching anyone. You know, uh, in terms of being shocked, like, can you believe the school did so poorly? What I see when I see uh, poor performance on tests, it doesn't tell me anything about the quality of teaching that's taking place inside the buildings because I know inside quote unquote failing schools that there's some dope teachers and some fly learning going on inside those spaces. What it tells me is where poor people live at. Uh -huh. So whether it's rural white folks or urban black folks um, or some uh, Hmong Asians in central um, in, in center of the country, uh -huh. you just know where poor people are. Mm -hmm. And that's all the tests tell you and research says that and been saying that stuff for decades. So the fact that, um, the, fact that the, uh, the accountability metric has been used along with this, uh, along or as a consequence to these tests 
just really just shows people if they folks are paying attention that their neighborhoods, their schools, their staff were targeted for whatever interventions they they were going to mandate upon them. Which brings me into um, what we're talking about right now in terms of what's happening inside our communities. One thing that's really important to really understand is that billionaires again, and it's really important to understand that we're not necessarily having, we're missing the point if we're having, we're keeping this conversation only at educational, who delivers the three R's better, right? Because there's so much more going on to it, go, going on than that. Um, but folks have been making, a, rich people have found ways to make a whole lot of money specifically by exploiting the most vulnerable uh, populations in urban areas specifically. So the last quote I gave in terms of the number was $600 billion in public education funding, but that was really short trip. That was from 2012, 2013. And that was in terms of federal spending. But when you start at being that most of the spending in public education comes from the state, the most recent number I've been able to see based, based on today is $1.2 trillion in spending around public education from the federal and state level and local level combined. Um, so what, ha what has happened to over the last 20 years is that privatizers, rich folks, billionaires, hedge funds, um, hedge fund people have found ways to access $1.2 trillion where before it used to be off limits. So what does that look like inside our community? What it looks like inside our community is that our schools get taken over. So I, I do recognize that a lot of our, a lot of what takes place in terms of public education is very, very region specific. So what I will talk about in terms of what's taking place a lot in the Northeast is when you see charter schools come in to certain parts of urban neighborhoods, that is uh, a, a, an arm of uh, urban redevelopment to yield gentrification. So the first thing I, I ask when people tell me that, yo, man, we're getting, we're getting swamped with all these charter schools. The first thing I ask is, is your neighborhood go, or is your city taking on massive redevelopment efforts? And most of the time the answer is yes. So what you see is in the urban areas, when you start seeing certain types of charter schools in urban areas take place, it's because the city is actively trying to redevelop and redevelop, not in terms only in terms of land, but also in terms of demographics. So why do, what role do charters, do charters play in that? Is that for a while, we associated the idea that people were moving to suburbia, wherever the case would be, because of quote unquote school quality. What happens is suburbia has become an inefficient thing and folks, and a lot of folks in it's sort of like my age millennials can't really afford to stay there. So in order for cities to maintain a sort of middle income population who they need, they've established magnet schools and certain types of charter schools called democracy oriented charters, democratic oriented charter schools inside the cities. So that middle income group doesn't have to necessarily leave the city but they can stay in sort of the, the areas able to sort of get that tax base. I mean, the, the, the city is able to sort of get that tax base. So they're sort of restrict those folks from leaving. But we're also seeing at the same time in poorer, like uh, poorer neighborhoods, not so much the city center where there might be some upper crust folks or upper income owners live at. But we're also seeing inside when you get into the sort of the, the more ghetto type neighborhoods, you're, you're seeing what's called uh, mission oriented charter schools. Like that's like the KIPs, the Uncommons, the Ideas where they're more about testing improvement, getting, getting, getting kids college ready, all types of stuff. And what that, is, what, and what that looks like, is that's not about, that's necessarily, not necessarily about gentrification. What that is, is about land and real estate and taking, getting access to all this money in construction and mm -hmm. owning and then selling the buildings, getting rent paid to you. Mm -hmm. um, I got also, um, also in curriculum development. Mm -hmm. So in all these sorts of ways, there are ways for these folks to get uh, their hands on money all over the place. And with this new market or with new markets tax credit that happened under Clinton in 2000, that's when you start seeing a boom in uh, charter schools being established all across the country because hedge fund people are making hell of a lot of money, up to 39%. I mean, over, over, over 139% of their investment, they're getting back from that one tax credit and then when you add on empowerment zones and things like that, they're making money, they're doubling or tripling their money within seven years. So there's hella money in charter schools and it has nothing to do with education at all. So we can't only be talking about what teachers are better <laughs> or what schools curriculum is better because we're missing the boat. It's about money. And, and, and the most, and I'll stop here.
the saddest part about it is the saddest part about it is it's the same thing all over again neoliberalization to where the folks with the most power go into the place where the people who have the least and extract its resources and that would be money that's going inside of public education that's being diverted to people who are already rich so brother keith yeah. and sister don tanya you know how we left off on on part two and i was like you know y'all gonna school me well I, I had the little light bulb moment you know in between part two and part three and I want Sister Don Tanya to, to touch on a comment that she made as we were rolling out. But let me tell you what gave him a little light bulb moment. I said, I, I was just laying in the bed thinking in the middle of the night because I don't sleep much. People say, how you get so much done? Because I don't sleep. I just ain't made that way. Okay, so laying in the bed just thinking, you know, and, and I said, well... Keith said something about gentrification in charter schools. I was like, but the plethora of charter schools, I see, I mean, I see some gentrification happening, but I don't see the charter schools over there. And then I start like, it, it's, okay, so then I was like, well, wait a minute. I'm looking at the, the, the first thought of gentrification that came up for me locally was gentrification that had already been in motion for several decades. And yes, I am seeing hints towards gentrification in those areas. Okay. That are, I mean, right now they building it like, let's just improve the area. <laughs> you know that everybody just so interested in the chamber, the economic development, this, the economic development. We're gonna work on this strip right here. You know, and so then, you know, initially you like, yeah, you know, all right, they working where the black folks at. But then when you start thinking about the land ownership, and so then, for example, audience, what does that look like? Well, for example, uh, if a charter school closes, somebody asked me, they were like, well, so-and-so charter school is coming up for renewal, and, and we don't know if they're going to make it, but that that's going to be, you know, that property going to come back to the school system. And I see, had this conversation today. And I said, no, baby. I said, I said, no, 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 mm, no. It belongs to that corporation that they are leasing from, which is attached to, like, they go hand in hand. And to Don Tanya's point, she probably going to elaborate where there's a nonprofit board over that school or a for-profit board over that school, the school system does not own the building that they build with the tax dollars that are pulled from your neighborhood school to, that keeps your neighborhood school under-resourced. So, okay, I'm school board member and I know my school is under-resourced and been under-resourced for decades. I'm fighting for that school to get what it needs and every time you open up another charter, I got to fight harder because there's less resources in the pot, period. Period, period, period. The light bulb went off for me, though. Like, I, I get it. I mean, you know, like, I could see it locally. I, I got it in terms of, I know you know what you're talking about, you know, <laughs> et cetera. But in terms of me being able to see it happening locally, it was like, bam, there it is. And so then... Sister Don Tanya, you mentioned when we were leaving off of part two, you said housing, economic development, and how did you put it? Go ahead. That housing, education, economic development, and criminal and family court reform, they all go hand in hand. They're all go back to um, designing, you know, we used to call them redlining. It's all about designing neighborhoods and keeping power and control in the 1% that owns most of the wealth in, in our communities, uh, in our nation, rather. And um, I mean, Keith and I vibe so much. <laughs> I mean, just everything. I'm like, ding, 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 ding. Um, oh, man, where do I begin? I, I, it's not just about education. And it's not about educating our children, unfortunately. It's really about um, wealth and maintaining the wealth and control within this nation. Hence, um, like I said, which is why Alex issues the American Legislative Exchange Council 
does not only um, comprise of the education issue, they're all linked together. And if you do see some urban development or redevelopment going on, the first thing you're gonna do in, it, in order to attract individuals to that community is change the school systems. And like he said, there's two different things. There's one about ensuring that those students, those students, poor black and brown students stay on their side of town. You come in, you buy up some land, you put in a new school that will keep them there, call it the same, um, call it better, um, close down the other options like the traditional public schools. I'm specifically talking about my community. On one side of town, they closed down all of the um, all of the public all the public high schools in that area. Put up a, a charter school over there. Bought up some land. Put up a charter school. About three or four charter schools have inhabited that area. So when they're failing, they just shut down and restart again. Get a new charter. You know, a school instant instant A. And so you think about that because if those schools are so are doing well or better and have the latest and greatest. Um, then why don't the neighborhoods that are we consider better, why are they not sending their students there when there are no boundaries to, in order to send students there? So you have to really look at it. You've got these boutique schools that are happening in these gentrified areas, such as the with the classical curriculum. Um, we have a couple. And people from outside in suburbs do come into the city whose parents work downtown and they do send their students to those schools. But they do not send them across the street over yonder to where the schools are supposed to be um, so much better for Black, Brown, and poor students, which is very interesting to me. So my theory, this is just my thought, not backed up by science or research. My thought is, if I give you a shiny pity on your side of the street, you won't come looking for my um, my penny over here on this side of the street. You're gonna stay over there, and it's it's um, um, socially constructed voluntary segregation, mm -hmm. and that is what I'm seeing in my community. And um, it's a very interesting phenomenon. One one question that haunts me is why is this happening? And at one point, I thought it was a racial issue. It is not a racial issue. It's an economic way issue um, in maintaining wealth and power within a certain, um, to maintain the status quo laced in the words of equity and um, with smiling faces that look like mine, because if for all intents and purposes, these institutions are creating um, educators that um, have fast tracked their way to become administrators in some of these schools. You incub incubate for a year, you instantly have a six figure income, you're in charge of your own school, you have an idea that has not been researched or um, evidence based, you just have an idea and you're able to incubate a whole school and you you're in charge of your school and it's better because I'm a brown person or a black person and I can I can run the school and I can educate the students better. I, I'm torn for all intents and purposes. I'm, I'm, I'm that, that, that I, ideology now we haunts have, me, you know, because, um, what, you what, know, what is it that make you say it's all tied together? Like, and, and I'm sure that there are certain examples or certain, like you see it with the courts. The stuff. Walton Family Foundation. The Walton Family Foundation. You look at the Waltons and how they operate very anti-union, union busting. You talk about the power of the individual, if the individual knew power, the Waltons know that. The Waltons are very pro-charter. They push vouchers too. They get involved in those elections and they finance campaigns. And it's not because they have a good heart. It's because the Waltons are the embodiment of the American Legislative Exchange Council mindset. Uh, they do not want pub uh, such thing as public money, but if there is public money, we want it to serve us. That's why at Walmart we'll underpay our student, our, our, our workers, excuse me, and we will uh, throw anti-union pressure and propaganda at them, even as we teach them how to sign up for public assistance because they're underpaid. Oh, because they can't get enough hours. And even if they could, that's well, yeah, on purpose, and that is greed to the ultimate. All these Waltons worth over 30 million, in, excuse me, billion individually, and this is what they do. But you know, what Eric was saying, excuse me, Keith, 
was saying about the property, you know, the public doesn't see that, but yes, it goes back to money. And what uh, Dantanya was talking about, it, it's not racial, it's economic. Those were arguments for keeping slavery in place in the South. It's not racial, it's economic. But that's true. I am willing, I am willing to exploit you, not because I don't like your color, but because it's economics, folks. Just sorry, it's just got to yeah. be this way. No, and that is, ex that is exactly exactly what's going on here now will they say that out loud no no empowerment flexibility accountability investment grassroots that's what we're saying but what are we doing we're buying the property the school is on uh from the school that owns it outright they sell it to us because they have a privately appointed board and we got people in place. And then I'm leasing it back to the school who owned it in the first place. And so that, and like you say, and don't it can never go back to the school district and the fix is in. There it is, you know? Uh, so it, it does all tie together. And if you want one fine example of it, the Walton family of Bentonville, Arkansas, there it is. <laughs> Why and, that's who, and that is who is funding the work that is happening in cities across the country. They are ubiquitous. The they are the everywhere. Yes, the yep. city fund. The city fund. They are at the table. They are at the table, pretending to give us a seat at the table, but we're actually lunch. Right. There's a comment. In there the chat. it is. There, there it is. There's a comment in the chat that says that the community doesn't have a clue, and it's and he's absolutely right. Um, the community does not have a clue um, because it's laced in empowerment, as has been said before, where they are training parents to go speak down at the state house to advocate for the very thing that is not in their best interest under the guise of thinking that they're doing the best thing for their children. So they empower the parents, bring them to their side. Not only do they entice you with the gift cards, they entice you with um, prestige, Hey, I got to go down to the state house and make a speech. And in my community, uh, Stand for Children was writing speeches for our um, for parents. And you could see them at the school board meeting in the back, handing speeches to individuals. I mean, and they claimed, you know, they probably had a conversation with them and then wrote the speech for them. But the bottom line is, it's very interesting the um, parent empowerment, and that and that's that's where. And and I think in St. Louis, they're the um, the, the organization that's similar to mine in my city um, was doing the same thing. I mean, they have are you a talking about we Are you talking about We Power or Bridge to Hope? I'm talking about We, we Power. Power. <laughs> we Power, that, that was the one. And oh boy, did I feel, did I feel special, loved, and well-supported. But Flo got food out <laughs> and they all over the country, going to different workshops, trainings, having stipends and eventually join the team uh, to go ahead and push those messages. And it is confusing the impact that it has on the community because when you see a person coming from the community, now the whole team, the rest of the team that, that I worked alongside, that they weren't from St. Louis at all. There was just me and the lead that was actually from St. Louis. Everybody else, so let's say we have 11 people on our team Eight um, were former TFA members. Uh -huh. um, we had mm -hmm. of those people, only two of us were actually from the city, you know, and so, um, and then of those 11 people, only uh, three had children, you know, that would engage or interact even with the, with the school system at all. So it was, you know, propping up, um, like you said, writing speeches, coaching, handing out uh, this, these testimonials and things, writing articles, the whole nine um, to get the message out there and it's over, not, and it's over and over and over again. And it's not a, and it's not an accident. It's not a, it's not an accident at all. So if you if you 
if you go back and like look at 990s that they have in like ProPublic, if you Google it, you'll see a lot of this stuff is backed by about the seven, this like same seven to 10 billionaires like Broad, the Jewish Foundation, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, Dell, Dell Foundation, all type of stuff, uh, Walton Family Foundation, you're counting them. But yeah, you'll see these, you'll see, you'll see they, they, they fund every single step of the way from the messengers to the legislators of both sides of the aisle, to, um, to the schools themselves, to the construction of the buildings and the universal enrollment system that they use to f- get people funneled into their uh, into those corporate charter schools. It's funded by the same people. So from start to profit, it's the same people. And we get, we get, we get, we get taken from the idea of failing schools, want better, better for my kid. And a lot of folks, I, I think at this day and age, we're not really conditioned to ask follow-up questions or even just critique what we're hearing. Um, so we just hear what we say at face value and we just operate off of it. Like parents, we care about our kids. We want to give our kids the best that we are able to give. So that message, even though it's well-funded, you're giving somebody a laptop, whatever case it be, you've motivated that parent to seek what they view from their, their perspective, what, what's better. Meanwhile, they're hurting their own communities without even knowing it. And to be fair, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. You were going to say something earlier, and I was about to cut you off. Yeah. So, Gloria, you are a great example of someone. I just hang on to the fact that you said at some point you ask questions. At some point you ask questions. Now, the likes of the Walton Foundation, they will publicly say in their their annual strategic plans what, what they intend in their 2016 strategic plan, the Walton said, we need some more grassroots involvement, which I found hilarious because they wanted to buy it from the top down. We need to buy ourselves some more grassroots because they understand you get the face of glory and not really going to sell it. And they're not going to look at the rest of the TFAers there. They're not going to know they're writing ads and speeches and op-eds. They're not going to know that. They're going to see Gloria. She's one of us. She's in. And so that's why it's important, Gloria, that you are involved in this and others in the community who say, wait a minute, I used to be for this. I get it now because the, the Waltons can't, they, they can't handle you. If you start asking questions and then saying, wait, this was done. I participated and now I know what it is. And we had a commenter in the chat saying, this is so sad on one level, yes, it is so sad. But what is great is that we've got someone in the chat hearing this and yeah. learning of this. It's yeah. like, so now you know, this is not new. It's not new today. It's just someone is learning of it today. And that's the whole point of this discussion. Can I just say one thing? Because oh, I, oh. uh, I saw a comment, and I think I say this often, and I think, I think it may rub people wrong with but I don't mean to. Uh-huh. Um, but I think one thing that if we're actually talking about this issue seriously, we have to understand the political reality that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I talked last time briefly about sort of the concentration of, of power and the consolidation of uh, political and economic power. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a there's a there's an article um, or research done by uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Payne from Princeton. I think it's from 2015. And they want to talk about like how real is democracy and how how likely are lawmakers act to act off of what the public uh, want. And what it says is, is that in elections, right, voting for people, democracy matters, obviously, because that's what gets people elected. But from the time folks are elected to the time they are legislating, the public, the, the, the average public person has virtually, that, they, that they're able to see virtually over, over 1,779 different issues over a course of uh, 15 years. Has the average person has 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 no impact at all on the way legislators vote? So I, I, I so I want to I want to I want to bring that to the attention because we talk about like you know we need to get out in the streets we need to sign petitions we need to show up, but the reality is what somebody campaigns on and what someone does when the issues are on the table because of who they're getting donating uh, donations from are two completely different things. How do you take that on? And I think 
this is again, I talk about, we're talking in the space of education, but across yeah. every single issue that confounds us today, that's the issue I think that's central to getting anything done. The reason why we don't have Medicare for all is not because the public, the American public don't want it. We do. Like 80, like 84% of Americans want Medicare for all free universal health care. Why don't we have it? It's not because of public will. It's because our legislators are bought off from both sides. And until that reality is confronted, we're going to be having these conversations about how messed up things are and agreeing, but not seeing the, uh, not seeing the, uh, the, 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 the impact um, by, you know, when things are, when things are brought up. So I just wanted to bring that, put that out there. Sorry. That's all right. Well, but that you, you, you mentioned something that I, I definitely wanted to go back to in any way, which is, you know, all right, so accountability's impact on the governance of, of schools, the de-democratization of schools, and the lesson power of genuine grassroots efforts. I mean, to your point, it's hard for the mother of a, oh, I'll use myself as an example, shucks. Okay, my boys are grown, they out my house, hallelujah, <laughs> okay? But when I was a single parent in undergrad, working on my uh, uh, English degree, working on my master's degree, and working full time while raising two children, okay, um, because let's not even just reduce it to our to our poster to our poster child parent. Poor Susie working two jobs at minimum wage. No, all right, I'm working a full time job, educated, trying to get more education. All right, but and, and stretched thin, busy. Most people, whether they making seven twenty five an hour or a hundred thousand dollars a year, most people flat out barely have time to pay attention. Period. And so then it's hard for folks to compete. It's hard for real folks that are being impacted to compete with staying knowledgeable and aware and keeping up with who they voted for after the day they voted for them, okay? Period, okay? It's hard to compete with that when somebody else who got them in the seat via their uh, running their campaign through a PAC or what have you is in their ear or even gave them a job after the fact. So now not only have I funded your campaign, boo-boo kitty, you owe, you, you, you relying on me to pay your light bill, to pay your car note for the prestige you got. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to compete with. So then, but then even for those people, that is not enough. Like, weakening your democratic control in those ways still is not enough. And so what would they prefer? A non-elected board. So they don't have to waste money, at least on the election part. That's, that's another danger of charter schools, okay, is that and everybody want to say, show up to the public school board meeting. And yes, please do. I don't mind being held accountable, baby. Show up and show out. <laughs> we pay attention. Okay. But did you go to the charter school meeting down the street? If you knew about it. If you know about it. <laughs> in full disclosure. Yes, ma'am. I was the poster child for vouchers in my state when I was a single, when I was a single mom, um, yeah. I got, when I was divorced, I believe that the best choice for my children was a private school. And I was, um, courted to, um, be the poster child for charter schools. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I learned what my voucher was doing to the public school system, cause I would have sent my kids to a public private school anyway, mm -hmm. I, um, could not in good conscience continue to take it. And then that's when I got into this whole um, education debate um, mm -hmm. and understanding. And then um, I, I, um, <laughs> then, um, I had to I, I also homeschool my kids for a year because I had to de-program de, um, them, one of my children, because he was um, um, uh, abused mentally and thought that he was not smart. And I had to under, help him understand. And then he tested into all honors in the public school. Yeah. So, um, and I taught at a charter school for one year because they needed an English teacher um, two days before the school started. Mm -hmm. And I, <laughs> and my husband who was ostracized from the public schools because he was bringing these issues out, um, called me up and said, Don Tanya, I need you to come over here and teach English. And so I went over, got the job and taught English and the things. So looking at this debate from all the angles and I'm, I'm 
glory on the parent tip and how they court these parents and to doing, to signing on to this, to help push the agenda for further is, um, is unethical and, and it's got to be immoral. But as the commenter said in the chat, um, they don't know because it's done under the guise of it helping and empowering these parents and they want what's best for their kids. And if you tell me that this, this poison is good and it's not gonna hurt me, I might drink it if it's in a, in a particular familiar casing. And so um, it's, it's diabolical what's happening, but um, we can't just, you know, I am, um, maybe I'm an optimist. I still believe in power of the people. I'm sorry, Keith. <laughs> I believe in power of the people and I believe in hounding your legislators. And that's that they get to hide behind a cloak of anonymity because we don't go down there and find out who are our representatives on every level and keep holding them accountable. While we're talking about the issue and beating, it, um, beating a dead horse, they're passing legislation because the new privatization move, um, topic of the day is going to be dyslexia. And I looked up all of your laws in, in Louisiana and in New Jersey, y'all, just this past legislative session, um, those advocates were down there and got them and got the bills passed in your jurisdiction. And I'll, and I'll share, I'll tell you what, what law, what it's called in your area, but. <laughs> Did you get Missouri? Did you pull Missouri down, Tanya? Let me see. For the dyslexia. I Hold know on. critical race theory is a hot topic all of a sudden, too. And I know that they have something to do with that. But Whose talking yeah. points come from Alec. Yes, Missouri. Um, no, Missouri's um, um, bill on the dyslexia was dying in committee. It was SRB 216. OK. All right. Now, but help viewers close your thoughts out, if you will. Uh, Don Tanya, by helping viewers understand, okay, I mean, what what is it that you're seeing that is at issue? Like, okay, well, the, the dyslexic babies need, right? I mean, you know, I mean, that's your response to everything. The every child can learn uh, disparities, yada yada. So the dys dyslexic child needs support. What's wrong with this legislation? Well, biometric data. So what they're doing is now there's going to be an app that is going to be utilized to help your child learn. And so this, this, this app is going to watch eye patterns, um, collect biometric data. So there's a privacy issue potentially. And there's also um, going to, there's some legislation and you can look at this on the NPE, the Network for Public Education uh, website because we're just now collecting this data. Um, because it's going to be a wise while we're arguing, they're still pack. I mean, while we're discussing issues, they're still passing legislation to move forward their agenda. It's just another tool that is going to be monetized in this whole debate. And now the topic of the day is dyslexia. Now I'm not saying that um, dyslexic right. children don't deserve the best quality education that money can buy. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that this is testing was one tool that they used to. Um, get into our schools. Now, one, another marketing tactic is going to be we can teach your child to read um, starting in sec second grade. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of stuff. You've got to look at the specific legislation, but the agenda is the same and the model legislation is similar across the board. Thank you. But Mercedes, Mercedes, God, Dr. Schneider, Dr. Schneider. Oh, okay. Look, Snyder, Snyder. <laughs> yes, yes. I need you to go when she said that biometric data, and and I hate that. Um, shoot, I thought that book. I could have just showed y'all the book. Cap, uh, surveillance capitalism. Uh, there's a book out there about a big, big book about Mercedes, uh, Mercedes capitalism, surveillance capitalism, and just like you really need to be cognizant of how data is being used across the board, but it's, it, it's egregious it, when we're doing it to our children, when it's happening to our children. So when she said biometric data, I need you to tell us about that blog you wrote with the Florida, in Florida, 
about this, the use of student data that's already being collected in schools. And you think it, you thinking when they say analyze data, the average person is thinking they only talking about how your child performed on the test as it relates to school scores and the yada, yada, yada. But once that data is there, okay? And they, let me show you. Well, how you know, uh -huh. there's a lot, you know, there's a lot out there right now when Dantanya was talking about the app, mm -hmm. that, that right there would have gotten the attention of some parents. Yes. Uh, because it's like, okay, you start talking app and you're, you're using technology on my child to monitor my child. Mm -hmm. And that, that doesn't go over well with a lot of people, you know, the, the using, collecting data on individual children, whether it's through an app or through Google classroom or however it's going, there are parents in an uproar over the collection of data. Now, what, what makes this interesting is those same ultra conservative parents who want the school voucher are also in an uproar over any kind of violation of student privacy and the collecting of data and that sort of thing. So that really makes for an interesting mix because they don't want, they don't, don't collect data on my child. But the Florida article, that, that was uh, the use of a, a shock therapy uh, on children uh, to modify their behavior. And I noticed that uh, the budget uh, had a comment in it about uh, they're not going to use any federal funding for schools that are using some kind of uh, aversion therapy, shock therapy tactic on students, devices to shock. And I was like, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. And I found out where. Now, interestingly, some of the parents of some of these special needs children and young adults who, who had the shock therapy said that's the only way we can keep them in control. So it's highly controversial. But just the idea of devices and data in general, that, that's going to get a lot of people's attention um, they, they are concerned about, you know, uh, the, the idea of using devices to gather information on their children. Of course, it just depends on what they know, what well, the parents know. Well, in, in uh, the, the, the headline that you used that, that really caught my attention was that the state, the student data was used to tag kids as potential criminals. Right. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. So we're jumping. I'm sorry. We're jumping blog posts. My mistake. I thought it was the blog, the one about the using the shock therapy. Yes. This is well now. I mean, so but go. Yeah. That's the one I was talking about. Student student data, and I'm trying to think. Uh, the shock therapy might that might have been in Nevada, but in Florida. Thank you, Dawn. In Florida, there was a deal between the school board uh, and the, the law enforcement, and they were basically profiling. And in the name of preventing crime, uh, they were profiling young people and going after some who had records and really harassing them uh, in the name of preventing future crime. And so that school board, as of the last writing, they're being sued for it. But they did not completely back out of sharing student data with law enforcement. And that is just, that's without parental consent. That's even without some of the principals of the schools knowing it was happening. Uh, and so data is power. Data is power. Now, I'm going to wrap us up with this. We already talked about, let me just, as a visual aid, let, let, let's pull it up. Let me share my screen. We already mentioned, all right, that when we started part one, Reagan administration, nation at risk, 1984, and you see that 
that's when things really start to spike. Let's think about this. The privatization of education being tied to profits elsewhere. You remember when we were at the state capitol with Jindal? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Okay. Do you remember that time that CCA came up? And um, who was that? Louisiana, uh, Louisiana uh, that other, is another Louisiana blogger who brought it to our attention. It's a couple of good- Michael Destel? May have been him. Tom Aswell? Or Tom Aswell. Maybe so. Yes, I think so. And he had gotten a copy of the, of the letter from CCA. I uh, forget the, the acronym of CCA, something Corrections America, right? So a private prison corporation was ready to come into Louisiana. And the letter was saying, in order for us to come, to guarantee our profit. We need guaranteed seats in this prison. Now you keep in mind the little statistic that folks keep throwing around when they wanna talk about equity, third grade reading level. If they're not reading by third grade, that's what creates your sense of urgency, okay? Which is important. I'm not saying that it's not important, okay? But you gotta connect the dots. If you're not reading by third grade, they are already holding a prison bed for you. Okay? And then, coincidentally, though, all of this stuff is happening and correlating at the same time that we want to demonize educators, that we want to impact students' morale and teachers' morale and, 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 and lessen our respect of our educators, reinforce the notion that poor children just ain't got it. In addition, not just poor children, but coincidentally and oddly enough that children of color, regardless of income, for some reason, there's still a disparity. <laughs> so they got the resources, but you know, and I have to do another panel a later time on digging deep into the actual test they're like the actual tool that's used is all is is biased off the top, like by race and by class. Okay, uh, that's something that we cannot overlook. And that's Dawn. Can I make a comment? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. This um this diagram that you have up right mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. um, you notice that the prison growth actually really starts around 1973. Yes, and that's when it's turning up. You notice that's really when it, okay, that's the beginning of ALEC. That's when ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, really became something. It had previously existed in its infant form in this late 60s. But mm -hmm. that's also Alec in its early and quiet years was very much tied to Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan. So I would argue that this started happening before 83. It yes. started really happening around 73 with the push, the Alec push to privatize everything, to privatize public entities. Yes. That's thank when I that, that's when you're starting to see that. Yes, thank you. Thank you for lifting that up, that specific point. Yes, thank you. Now, let's close. Oh wow, I didn't realize it was 744. So I look. So let's close out for real, right? Uh Keith, go ahead, go ahead and um uh, and close us out. Oh, I just want to say thank you all for um for being uh being here and share your perspective and your viewpoints. Um, some of you folks I've met vir you know, virtually in other spaces and things like this. Um, and some of you guys I meet for the very first time, but I really do appreciate you guys coming and sharing and teaching me and teaching everyone who's watching. I think I'm sure you all learned some stuff. Um, so thank you guys for having me and uh, you know, hope, hope our paths cross uh, soon sometime in the future. Yes, thank you all again for joining me on this. It's special. been a pleasure folks, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you all for making the time. 
I appreciate it so, so much. And I hope that folks got, uh, got a little, gained a little knowledge and uh, reach out to us. I'll put you in contact with any other uh, speakers if they mentioned something that uh, touched you and you need, need some more information, holler at me, I'll make sure I connect you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to those. Thank that you. Yes. Thank you. Good night.